and welcome to this nice fall day. And if any of you were out and about when it was raining and the sun was shining, I know out over the lake there was a beautiful rainbow. And it was all the brightest one that I have seen in many years. So it was... Yes, I guess Ron got a picture. I didn't go out because it was raining. <laughs> but yes, it was a gorgeous rainbow. Welcome to those listening on the radio. <clears throat> and welcome to those that are <clears throat> using our streaming service of BoxCast. And I'll repeat, if you're ever in the area at 915, we'd love to have you come in and worship with us. It was so chilly in here this morning, we hadn't switched the, from the air conditioner to the heat. So now the heat's on. <coughs> if it get warm, that's how it is. It'll kick off in a while. It was 58 in here when... Mary came in and started practicing. <clears throat> Before I go to the upcoming summing, sum, Sundays, I'd like to welcome Denise Skydema to the pulpit today because Pastor Bev's son is having surgery today and she wanted to be, um, be down there in Kalamazoo, so that's why Pastor Bev is not here. And if Denise hadn't offered, <laughs> you would have got me, so... <laughs> Uh, you, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking at next Sunday, and that's what I'm talking about today. <clears throat> so you might have a little bit of overlap. <laughs> um, look at our congregation. We're not, probably not going to remember. <laughs> there might be a couple out here that would remember what she spoke on. Anyhow, I have a um, note here that I'd like to read, I was told to read it today, to our Mears family. We want to thank you for our warm welcome. It is with bitter, bittersweet feelings that we will be leaving the John Gurney campground and you. Due to age and health issues, we have decided it is time to sell our, our trailer. We are going to miss the friends we have made. We will miss Pastor Bev and her down-to-earth, tell-it-like-it-is sermon. Thank you again, <clears throat> Denny and Barb Baldwin. And I, Kelsey, I don't know if we have a current address for them, but we will get get a current address if you would like to send them a note. And post it out. We'll post it out on the bulletin board. Well, there are Holland address in the directory. The Holland address is in the directory. Okay, if you have the if the, you have the current directory, their Holland address is in there. <clears throat> so we will miss. Uh, Barb and Denny. Um, next Sunday, October 15th. Where is the month going? A chosen covenant, loyal to Christ, and it's taken from 1 Timothy 1, 6-7. And the following, the 22nd, a chosen covenant, faithfully participate, and that's taken from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 41-47. to 47. All Saints Day is November 5th. If you want loved one's name, picture for All Saints Day, please send them to Kelsey at mearsumc at gmail.com by November 1st, which will be sooner than... Also, Halloween volunteers are needed for Halloween. Let Pastor Bev know if you want to help with the planning this year, and I'm not sure when maybe the meeting is next. There's a sign-up sheet and all stuff out there. <clears throat> October meetings. The ministry team will meet on October 11th at 10 to approximately 11.30, and then shortly after, United Men and Women will meet. And hopefully someone will sign up to bring lunch. Um, there will be no chosen study group on Tuesday, October 10th, and Mears. People can attend Shelby's on Sunday, October 8th at 12.45. I'm sorry, that's Actually, that got canceled, so for both, huh? Okay. I can't take the words back, but it's been canceled. If you'd like to have your anniversary or birthday announced, let us know when it is, or raise your hand if you are here. <clears throat> I did get a, I received a call from Becky Snyder, and Larry's birthday will be October 10th. 
and we will sing happy birthday in a minute and stand up, but I forgot I do anniversaries usually first. So back up. Uh, anniversaries this week of October. No hands. Now I can do birthdays. And Larry Snyder's is the 10th. And Debbie DeBro has her hand up. For the 10th. Yours is also the 10th. Brian? Yours was the 6th. Okay. And you weren't here. That's right. You were camping. Anyone else? If able, would you please stand up and face the camera and we'll wave happy birthday to Larry. <clears throat> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And as you're standing... <laughs> Because I was going to say, stand for the call to worship. Okay. And as we're standing, take a breath and breathe in God's grace and exhale God's praise. And our call to worship. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. For you not give me up to show or let your happiness. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. <clears throat> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the Our opening hymn is found in The Faith We Sing, and it's wrong in here, and it's 2216, When We Are Called to Sing Your Praise.
Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you, thank you, and glorify you. We confess today that you are a good God and that your desire for us is always, always, and always good, no matter what. We thank you that you desire only good things for us and never bad. We praise you for the beautiful fall colors emerging, the marvelous glow of the rainbow. We give you all the honor and glory. Amen. This is when we have our God winks and uh, lift up people for prayer. And I know we need to let, lift up Pastor Bev and her son, Kent Dykema. Uh, Joyce Ensign is in the hospital with a lung infection. Uh, Christy? She, she, come home Friday night. she came home Friday night. That's... Lord, hear our praise. praise. <laughs> oh, Lord, it, okay, we'll get there. Um, go back to the prayers, concerns. Okay, I said Pastor Bev's son Kent, and he had complications. He had a, was having an appendectomy. And he's got some health issues besides. Lord's in your mercy, hear our prayers. <clears throat> Are there any others? Donnie. We have a friend who is undergoing chemo right now, and he'll be uh, having it for six months, and it's lungs, bones, and stomach. And that's Dottie, who has a friend going through chemo and <clears throat> at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Let's go to some praise. Do we have any praise today, any joys? Noreen got to see her family. Noreen got to see her family. Noreen got to see your family and you got home safe and sound. That's good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our praise. Oh, and we have a rainbow on the screen. Yes. Brian? I can say my sister was, we had prayers for her about a month ago because she was really bad. And she's recovered quite well. It's God is good. God is good. Brian says um, his sister is doing much better. Lord, in your mercy, hear our yeah, praise. Right. And yes, we thank Denise for being here today. <clears throat> Anne. Praise for my sister who went to her heavenly home on Thursday. Oh. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our praise. Is this your oldest sister? Yeah, the 99-year-old. The 99-year-old. Wow, what a wonderful, what a wonderful time. I can't say that. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our praise. I think I said it. Will you pray, please? I could. I <laughs> should. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the strength in our lives. No matter what trials that we may face, we, may we never forget the blessings you have shown us. May we always remember your steadfast love and faithfulness to each and every one of us. We pray for all on our prayer list and the unspoken. May they feel your love, your power, your healing arms wrapped around them. We pray for our community near and worldwide. We pray for our leaders and give them the wisdom to lead and guide us as you would want them to. We give you praise again for the beautiful fall colors, the rain, and even the chilly temperatures because it is only you that has the wisdom in bringing this to our surroundings. We give you praise for this harvest season and all that it brings to those that depend on it. The apples, the pears, the pumpkins, 
the gourds, and all of these fall crops. We also praise you in giving us the marvelous Lord's Prayer as we say it. May we truly remember and pray its true meaning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So even though we might have any little ones, I still like to do a children's message because we all learn from a lot of it. Okay, Dr. Seuss, many of you know these beloved books. I did not have the one that they're, we're going to talk about in particular, but I did have a few of them at home. And to <coughs> think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. <laughs> the Tooth Book. <laughs> the classic, Cat in the Hat. And are you my mother? <laughs> the book that I don't have is one that's called Horton Hatches the Egg. So, have you read that story? Horton Hatches the Egg by Dr. Seuss? Yes. It is a wonderful story about an elephant named Horton. The story begins with a lazy bird named Maisie sitting on her egg in a tree. Sitting on the egg was tiresome and boring, and Maisie hated it. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest, if I could find someone to stay on my nest, said Maisie. That's when Horton walked by. Maisie asked Horton if he would sit on her egg while she took, while she took a little rest. Horton objected at first, but Maisie promised that she would not be gone long, so Horton finally agreed, and soon he was sitting on the nest while Maisie flew off to Florida for vacation. <laughs> In Florida, Maisie had such fun, she decided she would never return to the nest. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, but Horton kept sitting there, day after day. Winter came, and icicles hung from Horton's trunk and his feet, but still, he remained faithful to his promise to Maisie. I'll stay on this egg, and I won't let it freeze, he said with a sneeze. I meant that what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful. 100%. Now, I don't know if elephants really are faithful 100% or not, but I know someone who is. God is faithful 100%. The Bible is full of promises of God, and God is always faithful to keep his promises. In the Bible, there is a story about a man named Simeon, Simeon was, very, was a very old man who had faithfully served God all of his life. Simeon was looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. God had promised Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Christ, the promised Messiah. A few days after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to God. Simeon was in the temple. As soon as Simeon saw the baby, he knew that Jesus was the Christ and that God had kept his promise that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. 
God is faithful to his promises 100%. Sometimes at the beginning of a new year, many of us make those promises, those, you know, all those things that we're going to do for the upcoming year. And I'm afraid that many times we don't fulfill all those promises. They're not ever, sometimes ever cut. If God is faithful to keep his promises to us, don't you think that it is important for us to keep our promises to him? So as we go about, may we make our promises to God, let us say, my important, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant, I'll be faithful to God 100%. Let's pray. Now, here we go. <laughs> Dear Father, as you are faithful in keeping your promises to us, may we be faithful in keeping our promises to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I got some activity sheets and some coloring. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you care. <laughs> Do you have crayons here, too? <coughs> okay, our hymn of preparation is Hallelujah. If you will recite with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture this morning was changed from what is in the bulletin, is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life he has promised through the faith in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. I am writing to Timothy, my dear son. May God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord give you grace mercy, and peace. Timothy, I thank God for you, the God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy 
when we are together again. I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that was first filled that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that some the same faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. Yes, I'm fine. I, I was waiting for the next. That's it, but for the people of God. And I drew a blank. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. Am I all right? That's, that's debatable. We won't go there tonight. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Throughout history, fear has been one of the most formidable enemies humanity has ever faced. One of the least known catastrophes brought on by fear happened during World War II in the subcontinent of India. It has come to be known as the Bengal rice famine. From October 1942 till October of 1943, somewhere between two and four million people died of starvation in India. They did not die because there was lack of food. They died because the government acted on fear rather than fact. The local government in the Bengal area was afraid that the Japanese would invade their country as they invaded Singapore and Burma. In reaction to this supposed threat, decisions were made by the local Muslim leaders to move the bulk of rice and foodstuffs to Calcutta, which was deemed more important and more defensible, leaving millions in the rural areas without adequate food supplies. The Japanese never came, and before it was over, millions were dead of starvation, most of whom, ironically, were Muslim. They died because crops were hoarded to avoid them from getting into the hands of an enemy that never came. They died because of fear. Fear is the enemy of faithfulness. It is the true immobilizer. It has frozen many people in their tracks and kept them from accomplishing all they were created to do in God's kingdom. Fear caused the Israelites to grumble and complain as God was about to deliver them from Pharaoh's advancing army. Fear froze the armies of Israel before Goliath. It caused the disciples to <clears throat> wake Jesus from his sleep in the midst of a storm. It caused Peter to deny Jesus during the Passion, and it has been the culprit in many Christians' failure to be and do all God has commanded them to be and do. Fear has long been the enemy of faith and continues to derail those whose heart's desire is to be steadfast and faithful in their service to the Lord. It is somewhat comforting, however, to realize that great men and women throughout history, people who have accomplished great things for God, have also had to struggle with fear. Many great people who ultimately pr proved to be faithful along the way were ten tempted and gave up. Our text this morning gives us insight into how we as Christians can overcome fear, specifically the fear that keeps us from being effective servants in God's kingdom. It tells us how to be steadfast and faithful. In the first seven verses of 2 Timothy, Paul reveals to us something about the personality and makeup of Timothy, his son and ministry. Paul had poured his life into Timothy. He had worked hard uh, at developing him into the person he would need to be to assume the responsibilities he would one day inherit. As Paul sits in a cold and damp prison cell, Facing certain death at the hands of the Roman Emperor Nero, he, he is preoccupied with one thing and one thing alone, the forward movement of the gospel and the kingdom of God. 
We are not privy to other concerns that may have weighed upon his mind. As he writes under the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Paul tells his young protege, Timothy, the essential things he will need to know to carry on with his work. Central to Paul's message in this book is the preservation and advancement of the gospel. Timothy, however, by personality and nature, is not one we as humans would normally deem fit for the task. He, shy and retiring, timid and fe fearful by nature, Timothy would seem, at least from a human perspective, to be an unlikely candidate to assume the mantle of the great apostle. And yet, as 1 Samuel 16 reminds us, God does not see things as man sees them. Whereas man looks at the external appearances, God looks at the heart. God sees us, not based on what we can do, but based upon what he can do through us. If you've ever felt inadequate for the task, if the fear of failure has ever gripped you, if you've ever felt like the passion of fire which once characterized your service to God has burned low and is danger of going out, this is a book for you. If you've ever found yourself spiritually dry, feeling alone, and useless in God's kingdom, there is a word from God for you this morning. Notice four things our text says will enable us to overcome our fear. In verse 3 through 4, we overcome fear and remain faithful by reassuring one another. The nature of this letter is intensely personal. Paul loved Timothy as a son and writes to him as a father would write to a son. While he is painfully honest, notice that before he calls upon Timothy to rekindle the flame within him and abandon his fear, he begins with words of reassurance, words that encourage and strengthen. All of us need words of reassurance. All of us need someone who will love us enough to encourage us. In verses 3 and 4, Paul says five things that speak to reassurance. Number one, gratitude. I am thankful for you in verse 3. It's always encouraging to know that someone can appreciate what God has done through you and is thankful for, to God for you. Paul was grateful to God for Timothy, for his ministry, and for his friendship. It's always nice to know that as others remember you before the Lord, that it is with a sense of gratitude, not with a sense of grief or complaint. When was the last time you thanked God for a brother or sister in Christ that he has put into your life? When was the last time you told them that you were grateful to God for them. Number two, faithfulness. I am praying for you. Paul was quick to let Timothy know that he was making intercession on his behalf. One of the most encouraging things I have ever experienced as a nurse is the knowledge that there are folks out there praying for me, praying that God will protect me, will use me, and will continue to guide me. Fear often brings with it doubts, not only doubts about yourself, but doubts about others and doubts about God. When you know someone loves you enough to remember you in prayer, to be faithful in taking you before heaven's throne, it is reassuring and encouraging. Number three, fellowship. I want to spend time with you, in verse 4. It had been some time since Paul and Timothy had been able to visit one another, and yet time and distance had no way to, in diminishing the, friend, the strength of their friendship. Facing what was death, was certain death, Paul now tells Timothy that it is sure would be nice to see him again, to talk together about all that God had done and was doing. While Paul had been used greatly by God, he must never forget that like all of us, he was merely human. 
even as he wanted to strengthen and encourage Timothy, he too needed to be reassured and strengthened. He needed to comfort his friendship with Timothy and gave him. Then there was the element of empathy, of understanding what Timothy was going through. Number four, empathy. I know what you are going through. Someday, Paul is referring to when they had to part ways. And Timothy wept. Others hold that the difficulties Timothy had experienced in ministry had to lead to tears. Anyone who has spent time, um, a substantive time in ministry, understands that sometimes the going gets tough. Sometimes the stresses and the strains and disappointments and difficulties lead you to tears. Jesus wept out of compassion for those he loved, and anyone who has taken up their cross and is following him will also at times be driven to tears. I have dealt with a lot of death in my nursing career as an oncology nurse, <coughs> caring and ministering to families, experiencing their pain, and dealing with the personal loss of those whom God had entrusted to my care was nearly more than I could bear at times. I have shed many a tear with them and their loved ones. Paul had shed his share of tears. He understood where Timothy was. He understood what he was going through. In Acts chapter 20, verses 36 through 37, tells us that as Paul left Ephesus, he and those with him wept freely. It is encouraging to realize that others understand what we are going through and can, can empathize with us. Number five, blessing. You are a blessing to me. Paul saw Timothy as one of the blessings God had given him. It is always encouraging to know that you've been a blessing to others. Paul wanted Timothy to know that as he counted his blessings, Timothy was among them. What does it do to you when someone lets you know that you are a blessing to them? How does it affect you when someone drops you a note and tells you that God has used you to bless their lives? This is what Paul wanted to do in Timothy's life. He wanted to encourage him, to strengthen him, to lift him up from the pit of fear and despair, and to reassure him that he was still useful in God's kingdom and that Paul could see it. We overcome fear by reassuring one another. It is easier to be faithful to God when we remember his faithfulness to us. As the old song says, when upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. As a people, we have a tremendous capacity to forget. We forget that we are not where we were. We are simply because of our own efforts. We forget what others have done for us. We forget what God has done for us. And we forget what God has done for us. And we are tempted to believe that God has never used us or never will use us. Paul points back to Timothy, back to things in his life that demonstrate God's hand on him and his ministry. Notice two things. Number one, genuine faith. The apostle tells Timothy, as I think about you, as God brings you to my remembrance, I am reminded of the genuine faith that is in you. The Greek word for genuine is literally translated unhypocritical. In other words, Paul was saying to Timothy, the faith I've observed in you is the real thing. Perhaps Timothy's timid and fearful personality had led him to doubt his own salvation. Perhaps he had begun to question whether or not God had really called him to service. 
But Paul says, Timothy, I've been a Christian, a lot of Christians in my day, and from all of my experience, from all my observation, son, you're the real thing. Yours is the genuine article. What an affirmation. What a help in overcoming his fears to hear from, from someone like the apostle himself that his faith was recognizable as authentic. But more than that, Paul points back to his upbringing. Look at the rest of verse 5, a godly family. Timothy had been blessed to grow up in a Christian home. His mother and grandmother were both believers who, according to chapter 3, verse 15, had taught the scriptures to Timothy to him from an early age. Paul was reminding him that his call on his life, this evidence of faith, was not some anomaly. It was part of his spiritual heritage, part of the blessing God had bestowed upon him. I've heard a lot of testimonies in my day, as many of you have also. Some of these testimonies are dramatic, and we've all heard them. They tell of how someone lost in sin, addicted to alcohol or drugs, or about someone who for years had walked on the wild side of life, and then one day God hit them, hit them like a bolt of lightning, and they were gloriously saved. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes these testimonies tend to glorify the wickedness of their sin rather than the wonder of their Savior. And then there are those of us who are raised in a Christian home, who began going to church in an early age, whose parents taught them from childhood the great truths of Scripture, the wonderful stories of the Bible. And somehow we think that this kind of testimony is boring when compared to those whose conversions were dramatic. But, friends, I'm here to tell you the, that the greatest testimony anyone could ever give us is that we were blessed to have Christian parents, folks who loved Jesus and who modeled the faith in their home, a testimony that tells how they were spared from having to walk down the pathway, which leads to destruction, but from an early age realized that the straight and narrow way was the right way. I thank God I was reared in a Christian home, that I gave my heart and my life to Jesus at an early age. I thank God that I was spared a lot of things other people had to go through before they came to Jesus. But trust me, I did have to go over hurdles at various times. I am still faithful in my belief of his faithfulness to me. Paul wanted Timothy to remember that God had been working his plan even before Timothy was born. God was bringing that plan to fruition in Timothy's life, and the reality of God's work through Timothy's faith and his family was something that should give him strength and enable him to overcome his fears. We overcome fear by remembering what Jesus has done in our lives. Doubts and fears have a tendency to cause us to let the flame of passion, the fire of action, burn low in our lives. As Paul writes to young Timothy, who is probably in his early to mid-30s, by this time he tells him that he is going to assume the responsibilities for which God had pre or preordained him. He must keep the fire of passion for ministry alive in his heart. Timothy had been called by God to oversee the ministries in the church. He was called to be a pastor, and I can assure you that there will always be those who can test to your and see you through tough, that at tough times as really are. If the church of Ephesus was anything like most churches today, and we have not reason to believe otherwise, there were always those who questioned Timothy's authority, who questioned his ability to lead and his judgment. They caused him to be fearful more than faithful. 
To this, Paul enjoins Timothy to resuscitate the fire of the gift that is within him, to go back to his call, to the realization that he has acted as he is led, so did so he did so with authority from heaven itself. Let me suggest four things that I believe will strengthen your faithfulness. Number one, be strong in your walk. This speaks to both your walk with God and your walk with the family of God. We have a tendency to grow cold when our quiet times with God fall by the wayside or when, he see, when we cease to have fellowship with other Christians. Our fellowship with God keeps us connected to the source of our fire. And God has given us other Christians to fan that flame, to hold us accountable, to encourage us, to exhort us, and to work, to walk along with us. If you want the flame for ministry, the passion for service, to burn hot within your spirit, you must stay strong in your walk. Number two, be spiritual in your worship. We cannot allow what we do for God to become perfunctory or something we do not do just because we're supposed to do it. Worship should be ever personal and intimate. What we do for God should be the natural overflow of our relationship with him. We should take our ministry personally. We should see it as a reflection of our love for God. When what we do for God becomes more of a ritualistic practice than a relational passion, the fire within us will go cold and die. Number three, be in study of the word. It is nearly impossible to stay solid on your walk, to be spiritual in your worship, and keep the fires alive when you are absent yourself from time in the word of God. Like the prophet says in Jeremiah 20, verse 9, but his word is in my heart like a burning fire. If you want to keep the fire burning within you, study the word and it, it will ignite your soul. Number four, steady in your work. Keep your priorities what they need to be. The world is filled with many good things to do, but God directs us in that which is best to do. We are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we stay focused on what he has called us to do, our hearts will stay where they need to stay. Proverbs 16 verse 3 says, Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Some of you are here this morning, and you can look back and remember a time in your life when things were different, when you had a deep longing, a passionate fire within you to serve God, to accomplish something in his kingdom, but then life happens. It didn't call or happen all at once, but rather it was a process. Over the course of years, other things seem to creep up in and steal the passion from your soul. Maybe it was a bad experience you had at church, or perhaps it was something that happened between you and another Christian. Or maybe God did not answer your prayers as you thought. But I suspect that in most cases, it was nothing really that dramatic but rather over the years, the fire for ministry, the passion for service, simply began to burn low. To you this morning, God is telling you that he wants you to rekindle the flame, to fan the embers back into a flame. He has never changed his plans for you. He still wants to use you, but he will not force you to be used. You must want it. You must take the initiative. You must fan the flame yourself. Rekindle the fire and keep the flame burning, and you will not give in to fear because, as verse 7 tells us, fear is, it is not in keeping with the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Of all the things of which we need reminding, 
perhaps the most important, this is the fact that we are not alone. We have been given the spirit of God and his spirit is not one of fear, but of power, of love and sound judgment. The strength of man will always leave you fearful. There is always someone bigger, someone better, someone stronger, someone of whom in your own strength you should fear. One of the reasons so many Christians give in to the fear is because they look at things from the point of view of their own humanity. Can I do it? They ask themselves. Can I afford it? They question in their fear. And the answer is nearly always no. If you can do it without supernatural, supernatural strength, it is probably not of God. What is not of faith is not of God. God does not call us to do things that we can accomplish without him. In fact, Jesus tells us that without him, we can do nothing. Be an encourager. This is how we're going to apply this. As a Christian, we are to support one another, to hold each other up in prayer and encouragement. Look around you. Take note of the people God has brought into your life, and you will find there are those who need a word of encouragement, those who are paralyzed by fear and doubt. God has sent you to them as a messenger to encourage and strengthen them. Be an encourager. Be mindful of the past. Look back where you are and where you have been. Yes, you may be in a difficult position now, but if you'd be honest, you've been in difficult times before. God has not always been faithful to you before, or has God not always been faithful to you before? He will never leave you or forsake you. He will not leave you alone. He will accomplish in you all he has ordained. Be active in the present. One of the best ways to overcome fear is step forward in action. Make no mistake, young David was afraid when he went to fight Goliath. He was human, and therefore it was natural for him to be afraid. But he did not let his fear immobilize him. Stepping out in faith, he took action. The only way to overcome your fear is by exercising your faith. And faith without action is not really faith. Be reliant on the spirit. This is the spirit, the spiritual realm where we walk by faith and not by sight, where we trust in God and not in ourselves, where we are not calculating our success based on what we can do, but rather by what we know God can do through us as we yield to his spirit and trust in his strength. If you are feeling defeated this morning, succumbing to the empty threats of fear, trust in God. The Spirit of God given to you at the moment of salvation is not one of fear. It is not one of timidity or apprehension. If you have been given the Spirit of the living God, He is in you. He is for you, and He will give you confidence, victory, and triumph. He wants to do great things through you, to lead you to places you could never go on your own, to do things through you humanly impossible. God has given you his spirit to enable you, to equip you, and empower you for success. So when the dark whispers of the empty Try to freeze your very soul when the shadows of fear cast darkness across your appointed path. Trust in God. Look to, who, to him who is in your greater and who is 
with you and it will always be with you in this world. Trusting in your own strength will always lead to failure. Exercising your faith will lead you to victory. Trust in God. Rely on his spirit and he will use you in ways you cannot even imagine. Amen. Amen. Please stand for a closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, page 143, 140. coffee I believe it is a self-serve so help yourself to coffee and a cookie <laughs> it's okay <laughs> I pray that the Lord will bless you and protect you and that he will show you mercy and kindness May the Lord be good to you and give you peace. Amen.